So as I was saying, I was, I'm going to start with some regrets, not apologies or excuses, but regrets. Uh, first of all, I would love to actually talk about what Gene's just been saying, but I <laughs> can't do that. Um, well, maybe later. And also, um, I'm also regretful of my cupping. I chose to talk about the concept of moral. And I'm not going to talk about something I'd really very much like to talk about, because it's sort of Barbara Cassin, this subtopic namely words, namely the words moral uh, and moral, uh, moral in different languages, eth ethics, the, his the semantic history, it's all fascinating. And I even chose to talk about the concept of moral because it seemed to me simpler than talking about morality or moralist or moralistic. All of these, all of this fascinates me, but I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> okay, and um, but what I am glad, very glad about is that Talal Assad is here because I am going to talk about something he's written uh, about religion. Um, so, and, and by the way, this talk, what I've got to have to say is, is much more, how should I say, abstract than, than what Gina has been saying, and, and at, at a great, far greater distance from real politics. So, um, here we go. Um, what I'm going to do is talk uh, in two ways, in two parts. The first part is really about the very concept of moral, what that is, and in particular whether it's universal. And secondly, I'm going to say some things about morality and the moral as political, as a political concept. So first of all, the concept of moral. Now, I, by the way, I'm going to start by assuming that by moral we're talking about a category category of morality that is distinguished from what's not moral, um, and in other words, from other domains, so that what's moral, not talking about what, what is moral as opposed to immoral, because that distinction is a distinction within the category of moral. So the first question that I want to look at is whether we should take this to be a universal ca category. Should we view morality as Talal Assad use religion? Hassad writes that, that a universal, that is, anthropological definition of religion is unattainable. Not only because its uh, constituent elements and relationships are historically specific, but because that definition is itself the historical product of discursive processes. And in particular, he's criticizing the way in which Clifford Geertz thinks about religion. So, I quote again from Assad, socially identifiable forms, preconditions and effects of what was regarded as religion in the medieval Christian epoch were quite different from those so considered in modern society. Hence, the concept of religion as a transhistorical essence is illusory for, I quote again from Assad, different kinds of practice and discourse are intrinsic to the field <coughs> of religious representations, like any representations acquire their identity and their truth. So, he argues that the anthropological student of particular religions should begin by unpacking the comprehensive concept which he or she translates as religion into heterogeneous elements according to its historical character. So, is morality like that? Clearly, first, what we in modern society call morality is use Tarasa's words, the historical product of discursive processes. And the forms, preconditions, and effects of what was regarded as moral in the medieval Christian epoch and in countless others, past and present, were and are significantly different. There is, of course, no single agreed-on present-day definition of morality. Mor moral philosophers within and beyond the Anglo-American analytical tradition disagree about what morality is. 
and about what it's not. So uh, perhaps what Nietzsche wrote about moral philosophers is true then, of the contemporary moral philosophers. It is, Nietzsche wrote, I quote, precisely because moral philosophers knew the facts of morality only somewhat vaguely in an arbitrary extract of chance abridgments as morality of their environment, their class, their church, the spirit of their times, their climate, and zone of the earth, for instance, it's precisely because they were so ininformed and not even very inquisitive about other people's <laughs> ages and former times that they didn't so much as catch sight of the real problems of morality. For these come into view only if we compare many moralities. Well, uh, present-day moral, moral philosophers, as I say, disagree about how to define morality, distinguishing between broader and narrower conceptions. In particular, ever since a famous paper by Elizabeth Anscombe called Denouncing what she called Modern Moral Philosophy, uh, ever since then, uh, some have resurrected Aristotelian ver versions of virtue ethics alongside the utilitarianism that for a very long time dominated and prevailed. And, and what is in our time, I suppose, the dominant narrower view, most clearly and sharply articulated by Kant, the rights-based deontological view, the view in which universally applicable obligations are seen as categorical, categorical and unconditional and binding upon free and responsible agents. Well, it's this narrow conception of morality, which Charles Taylor uh, has described as narrow and complicated, <coughs> as focusing on what it's right to do rather than, rather than what is good to be, what it's good to be, uh, and on defining the content of obligation rather than focusing on the, uh, the nature, the notion, or the nature of a good life. <coughs> and uh, where there's no conceptual space for a notion of the good as the object of our love or allegiance, or as Iris Murdoch portrayed it in her work, especially the book The Sovereignty of the Good, um, as the privileged focus of attention or will. Now, it's this view that led Bernard Williams uh, in his book Ethics and the Limits of Philosophy to call morality a peculiar institution, echoing, of course, the ways which slavery was characterized. That we would be better off, thought Williams, without it, without morality. This morality system, Williams writes, with its emphasis on the purely moral and personal sentiments of guilt and self-reproach, actually conceals the dimension in which ethical life lies outside the individual. That's what uh, Williams wrote. He was, in this, strongly influenced by Nietzsche, the most corrosive critic of this conception of morality, much of which, of course, derives from Christianity. And uh, I think we can reinforce this thought, and here I defer to Baba Cassin, uh, by noting that in ancient eudaimonistic ethics, there is no term corresponding to our moral. Um, <coughs> But now I want to make the more general point that all these present day views of morality that I've just uh, surveyed, um, narrow and broad, Kantian, neo-Aristelian, neo or neo-whatever you like, are present day modern neo-views, incorporating background and foreground assumptions that are absent in other times and places. And that as Williams also wrote, arguing for what he called the relativism of distance, there's no route back from reflectiveness. That's a phrase that Williams uh, wrote. Now, uh, it seems to me that we, obvious <coughs> from all of this, that we should not be what is typically called essentialists. And that's very much Talar Assad's argument. We shouldn't think that just as there's no transhistorical essence of religion, so there's no transhistorical essence of morality. But notice that Talar Assad doesn't dispense in his work as far as I can see, he doesn't dispense with the concept of religion. And Nietzsche, who was no essentialist, because Nietzsche believed that there's no distinct phenomenon called morality, 
but rather what we might call family resemblances between various things so called. Nietzsche also wrote of, as I just quoted him, the real problems of morality. And at times, he wrote of a higher morality, meaning by that to signify the conditions for the flourishing of the highest types of life and human or human excellence. So what can license us to use the concept of morality while acknowledging and, compa and comparing not only many moralities, as Nietzsche proposes, but multiple conceptions of what morality is? <coughs> Now, I think it helpful here to resort, uh, uh, Jean referred to one of my favorite thinkers, Ian Hackett, so I'll do the same. I think it useful to um, resort to this idea, to this notion of social construction. Uh, is morality socially constructed? Now, morality, uh, we know, well, social construction, in his book, uh, Social Construction of What, we know from Ian Hackett that the idea, and I find it very Clarifying. The idea of social construction compri comprises three distinct claims, three distinct ideas. First of all, what we might call the contingency claim, that X, if X is socially constructed, then X might not have existed or been quite otherwise. For example, say, a totally alternative physics. That's the first claim. Or secondly, it could be the nominalist claim that X's unity or apparent unity is just is not a fact about nature or the world. It's just the result of being so named. That's the second for nominalism. Or thirdly, uh, uh, and thirdly, the, the the social construction idea is that what we might call the what we might call the sociological claim that X's stability over time is a product of consensual agreement within some community or other. So, uh, so here's the question: Is morality socially constructed? Well, is it contingent in Hacking's sense? Here I think, this leads to, I think, an interesting idea, a thought, that I think here we can see an asymmetry between morality, religion and morality. Because it's not problematic, I think, to suggest that we can engage in what Talal Asad calls the anthropological study of particular religions from a non-religious standpoint, from a viewpoint external to religion. <coughs> So we can certainly imagine, even look forward to a world without religion. But can we do this with morality? I suggest that given a broad, but not implausibly broad definition of moral, we are inescapably moral beings. For whom an amoral standpoint is simply a skeptical stance that we take up for the sake of an argument when engaging in the hermeneutics of suspicion. And I'm gonna to come to that in a moment. We are, I claim, inescapably moral beings, uh, psychopaths accepted, uh, whose human nature involves moral sentiments, <coughs> admiration for virtues, altruism, and the capacity for shame. If that's so, then we can't claim that beings like us might not be moral. From chimps and bonobos, other beings could, we might surmise, have evolved without morality, but they wouldn't have been humans. What about the nominalist claim that morality is just, uh, that, it, that, it, that the, the, the claim that directly confronts the idea of uh, there being a historical essence of morality? Here, I think, there are good reasons not to be essentialist. Let's put it that way. Uh, one is that even within any given moral system, say, what is widely recognized as the domain of moral behavior and thinking today in, in the West, or hesitate after yesterday to use that word, say, America, USA, um, there is not, as philosophers and others regularly assume, something in common and peculiar to all and only moral judgments to make them worthy of study as a unified topic. Any given morality seems to be essentially disparate in content, in form, in function, in phenomenology, and we now are discovering in brain mechanisms. And the second reason for uh, not being essentialists is that 
as the anthropologist Richard Schwader and his colleagues have argued, uh, that there are, there are distinct, and they argue that there are three big modes of moral discourse focusing respectively on autonomy, on community, and on divinity. I and mean, other people argue in this way, sometimes it's three, sometimes as the, in the work of Jonathan Haidt, it's six. Well, not going into any, any of that, one can dispute the analyses, but the idea is compellingly anti-essentialist. Uh, that is to say, um, central organizing values or conceptions of the good can be at work in different moral discourses <coughs> and even coexist in the same social space. So to sum up the anti-essentialist case, morality is heterogeneous or internally multiple and there's a diversity of morals. An old thought, an old phrase. Morris Ginsburg. Yeah. I think maybe that's his major contribution to the, 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 the phrase. <laughs> yes. yeah. um, so, about the sociological argument, the third, uh, the third leg of of, um, of uh, Hacking's <coughs> deconstruction of social construction of, yeah, of morality, the sociological argument that com that it's consensus that explains the stability of the object this case, morality. I don't have anything useful to say except here, except to make the Durkheimian point that it's plausible to study how punishment and ritual, for instance, help explain how moral codes are sustained and how they disappear and disintegrate, and how this is obviously a compelling sociological topic, and I think in a way what Gene has just been doing with the TRC it exemplifies this. The, 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 the explanation of how the ritual it works to um, consolidate and, and perpetuate ag agreements. Now, so if we're not to be essentialist about morality, must we be nominalists? Our morality is just whatever divergent usage of the word, or I should really say, Barbara Cassin, I way, the words, because they have different semantic fields. Is it just that, uh, <coughs> must, must we just dispose of moralities or whatever different usages of these words happen to pick out? Or is the moral a usable category in order, as Nietzsche puts it, to compare moralities? Or to adapt Kalala's Assad's phrase, should the anthropological student of particular moralities begin by unpacking the comprehensive concept which he or she translates as morality into heterogeneous elements according to its historical character. But if the answer to that last question is yes, what entities should a uh, student uh, bring, uh, what are the elements that such a student should bring under the category of moral? And what are, what are the entities? So I'm now going to offer you four very brief arguments for argument, or better maybe, says he self-protectively, four suggested considerations uh, <laughs> that, that should uh, lead us to see the category as usable and so, and so that we are so entitled. Well, first, recalling once more Nietzsche, there is the evidence across human history of innumerable genealogies of moral uh, I mean, Nietzsche comes at the, uh, at the tail end of, a, of an enormous history. Consider the panoply of creation myths, which typically address the question of moral origins and how humans acquired a moral sense. So just putting a toe into this, into this vast uh, 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 ocean, um, in which I'm no expert, the Navajo, for example, have a myth according to which the predecessor of human, humans were insects, including moths, who breeding incestuously, incestuously um, the, the, the moths, the, the insects bred incestuously, incestuously. And like moths, they, they fell from a high, high mountain into a fire to be attracted by the light. And then they discovered, the, the, the parents discovered crime and punishment. 
So, for instance. Uh, and then, of course, I need hardly uh, refer to the Garden of Eden story, which likewise recount, recounts the fall from animal-like innocence to humans' acquisition of a shameful sense of right and wrong. Now, with Nietzsche himself, we move towards a more naturalistic account of what we've come to call morality, valuing altruism, pity, egalitarianism, and so on. And we've also moved with Nietzsche to real history, that is to say, the triumph of Christianity in the Roman Empire. Well, on Nietzsche's account, the slaves revolt, led, of course, by the priests, who have split up from the aristocratic castes and invert, out of vengeance, their chival the, the chival chivalric uh, aristocratic values of, of the aristocrats, and bring about the mass internalization of ascetic uh, values and conscience and guilt and so on. Now, moving from myth, but myth that's nearer to science and history, uh, to genuine science, or something approaching it, I think we should consider a book, a remarkable book I've recently read uh, that, that's, that uh, sums up the work of the evolutionary anthropologist Christopher Byrne, uh, revealingly entitled his book, Moral Origins, the Evolution of Virtue, Altruism, and Shame, which induces evidence from studies of hunter-gatherer societies in which he is a considerable expert and uh, has indeed done anthropological, ethnographic work among them, diverse such societies, and gathering together the available knowledge we have, and archaeological evidence, and of course uh, studying primates as well, to develop the striking idea that the first human societies were <coughs> egalitarian. That is, his goal is to exp in this work <coughs> is to explain a series of traits, socially responsive, shameful feelings, and the accompanying bodily flushing, which is intimately related with self-awareness. <coughs> Excuse me. A deeply felt sense of right and wrong, <coughs> with a capacity to internalize group rules of conduct, a capacity that is based in personal feelings and in being morally worthy or unworthy. I think we're doing a Marco Rubio. Is there any water? Thank you. <coughs> so, um, um, so, 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 yes. So, uh, bodily flushing and, and internal life. So, Bur Bur Burton's proposed explanation is in terms of the ability of politically unified groups forming alliances to outlaw and punish resented alpha male behavior, thereby putting an evolutionary premium <coughs> on self control and suppressing free riders. And Burton himself, interestingly, makes the uh, following interesting comparison between his account and Nietzsche's. He remarks that whereas Nietzsche's story is about turn the cheek, turn the other cheek, weakness, and anti-Christianity, his own account, of Hunter Gatherers, uh, other uh, egalitarianism, uh, posits that the weak in joining forces to control the strong actually themselves become powerful. So that's the first consideration. Second consideration, for not being uh, nominalist, is an argument for seeing the category of the moral as transculturally useful. Usable. This arises out of that first thought, namely, first up, first consideration, namely that these various traits and capacities that moral origin stories, whether mythic or scientific, seek to account for, are what they what they are about are distinctively human traits and capacities, distinguishing humans from animals, other higher animals, from shameful blushing to emotionally identifying with wolves. Very interesting, just a, 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 a in passing to comment. Darwin was himself acutely aware of this problem and deeply interested in it. He even sent a, 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 a letter around to various um, colonial <coughs> imperial administrators in the British Empire at the time to ask whether the, the local people blush or not. Fascinating. Um, and uh, 
So, and, and the thing about Darwin is, in, in The Descent of Man, you'll find two successful, successive statements which, which rather beautifully contradict one another. I mean, at one point he says, there's a continuum from the highest animal to human beings. Uh, it's, a, it's a gradation. And yet, a few pages later, he's saying that what distinguishes the human from the highest ape is summed up in that short but imperious word, ought. Right, so, so um, Byrne writes, the point of comparison uh, with animals, that is, is the submissive, fear-based self-control of a domesticated dog or wolf, or of a bonobo or chimpanzee. Once we had acquired a full moral sense, which includes thinking in terms of a socially attractive virtue, as well as shameful vice, gossiping uh, accordingly to our, accordingly about our feelings and having a sense of our moral selves, the difference had become profound. The third consideration for not being on this, uh, but for thinking of the moral as a usable category, is a different idea that relates, however, to the second one. It's that there is a range of distinctively human sentiments. No one writes about this better than Adam Smith. Uh, such as sympathy, anger, resentment, gratitude, remorse, approbation, disapprobation, the love of praise. I mean, the list, the list is very long. Now, these are not only absent from non-human animals, but, and this is an argument that I've made elsewhere, they can be construed as constituting the emotional, sentimental side of the bridgehead that we always need for interpreting the cultures of other times and places. They are what we need to presuppose in order to make headway in making sense of practices and beliefs that will appear or may appear alien and sometimes impenetrable. They're the presuppositions we need to make the unfamiliar familiar. Also, I would argue. Now, the fourth consideration for, for being not, essential, not being essentialist is simply the claim that we can avoid essentialism and avoid nominalism by embracing universalism at the abstract level um, uh, uh, and relativism at the local. Consider as a most promising, what I think is the most promising exemplification of this approach, there are many, but the most promising, I think, actually is Charles Taylor's, uh, where he suggests that in all cultures, a complex recognizable as morality involves three um, axes. <coughs> Three axes are, first, our sense of respect for and obligations to others. <coughs> Secondly, our understandings of what makes a full life. And thirdly, the range of notions connected with dignity, dignity, honor, various ways in which that concept abstractly stated can be given specificity. Now, the relativism comes precisely there, where we see that the great differences in how these three axes are conceived and how they relate and their relative importance. So, quoting Taylor, for the warrior and honor ethic, there seems to have been a dominant, that seems, that seems to have been dominant among the ruling strata of ancient Greece, whose deeds were celebrated by Homer. The third axis, uh, dignity, honor, seems to have been paramount and even to have incorporated the second axis with our remainder. The agathos is the man of dignity and power. <coughs> and enough of this survives into the classical period for Plato to have depicted an ethic of power and self-aggrandizement as one of his major targets in figures like Callicles and Thrasymachus. For us, this is close to inconceivable. It seems obvious that the first axis has paramountcy followed by the second. But similarly, and I'm continuing with, a little bit with Taylor, it would probably have been incomprehensible to the people of that archaic period that the first axis should be conceived in terms of an ethic of general principle, let alone one founded on reason, as against one founded on religious prohibitions which put into no discussion. And again, people in a religious culture often ask whether the demands are conventional pure piety are sufficient for them, or whether they don't feel called to some purer, more dedicated vocation. And there is, I quote finally, a peculiarly modern sense of what respect involves, 
which gives a salient place to freedom, self-control, places a high priority in avoiding suffering, and sees productive activ activity in family life as central to our well-being. And I suppose to this one could add, of course, that the scope of morals becomes, in Peter Singer's words, uh, an ever wider expanding circle. In short, on this approach, what we might call a sad problem of, I hope you'll accept this characterization, the <coughs> problem of the parochialism of the modern, can be overcome in a Nietzschean way by comparing many moralities. Morality, we could say, could be viewed transhistorically and transculturally as the outcome of an interaction of diverse sets of culturally invented moral norms and involved human nature. These norms give <coughs> natural desires natural in the sense just given specified, natural desires, feelings, and dispositions, they give them specificity, these norms, and a practical orientation. They shape human motivation to promote social cooperation, strengthening feelings of other concern, rendering self-interest compatible with interest in others, rewarding cooperation and punishing violation. Some of these norms take the form of character ideals and conceptions of the good life. They specify the content these ideals and conceptions, fixing, fixing the locally prevalent values and virtues, what it is worthwhile for individuals to become and pursue. And they specify which ideals and conceptions have priority. Mm. Uh, have I got five minutes? Yeah, right, five minutes for politics. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> the moral is a political concept. <laughs> the simplest way to see the moral as a political concept is to universalize the hermeneutics of suspicion. <laughs> that is, uh, it is, of course, appropriate, even essential, I think, to apply the hermeneutics of suspicion partially. Marx, it's reported, when asked about what he thought about morality, would roar with laughter. He clearly had bourgeois morality in mind. And uh, Trotsky, when he um, wrote his pamphlet, Their Morals and Ours, uh, clearly had theirs in his sights. But suspicion of all moral discourse and thinking is another matter. So Plato reports Thrasymachus as saying that justice is nothing other than the advantage of the stronger. Bernard de Mandeville wrote that the first rudiments of morality were broached by skillful politicians to render men useful to each other as well as tractable. This view lives on and finds its most eloquent and relentless exponent in recent times in Pierre Bourdieu. Bourdieu deploys his distinctive concepts, capitals of various kinds, including cultural capital, in an economy of practices, symbolic power, symbolic violence, fields of power, in service of a one-dimensional vision in which there's struggle for advantage over others everywhere, and in which all practices are organized around cost-benefit calculation, usually more tacit than conscious, involving the investment, accumulation, expenditure, exchange, and consumption of a great variety of valued resources. Morality is entirely absent from Bourdieu's vision, from his writings and, th and thought, just as we might add, is power, <coughs> by the way, um, mirror image, power is absent from Durkheim's. Now, there's no doubt that reading Bourdieu gives us a thrill, a particular kind of satisfaction. But I think that we should question what it is that excites us about Bourdieu, why we find it gratifying. Bourdieu's project is the systematic unmasking and debunking social practices. And I want to end by, uh, just a, not very much longer, but I want to end with a distinction here that I think is helpful between unmasking, unmasking, and debunking. Unmasking is explanatory. It, it means revealing the hidden mechanisms or processes uh, that generate, the, for, for example, political consensus and compliance with the dictates of the, inter the interests of the powerful. Debunking is critical and sometimes denunciatory. It means showing the consensus to be in some way false, or the compliance to be in some way deceptive or misleading. Hence Bourdieu's talk of symbolic power involving misrecognition, favorability, mystification, and the harming of people's best interests. Unmask is, I claim, an essential component of the social scientific enterprise. As Marx wrote, if essence and appearance of things directly coincide with all science, the propensity to debunk, to be critical of deceptions, including self-deceptions and illusions that work against our manifold interests, is, I want to end by claiming, a moral, distinctively human capacity, not confined to social scientists, 
fact, not enough present among them. <laughs> it is part of the distinctly human need for such, for justification, for what the philosopher John Searle calls desire independent reasons. People require adequate answers to what Christine Korsgaard, Korsgaard calls the normative question. What is the normative question? It's why must I do what her eyes says? To which we can add, why should I obey, I obey the power? What ex or the law? Uh, why must I, um, what explains my suffering and subordination? Requiring adequate answers involves the capacity to detect inadequate ones. And the powerful, the powerful, can sometimes use their power to try, and sometimes they succeed in, dis in, dis in, 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 in disabling that capacity. Now, since, as I've suggested, there is no view from nowhere, no Archimedean point that is external to morality, or the moral point of view, it follows that no understanding of political life, for instance, of how hierarchies are sustained, in pure power terms, that exclude the role of moral justifications. No un account like that is ever going to be adequate. As moral beings, we need to understand what motivates, and thus what actors take to justify their behavior. We also need to understand when and in what ways and to what extent such justifying is shaped by power. And as for debunking, it can't go all the way down. To debunk illusions and in, uh, uh, must involve, debunk illusions must involve the supposition of non-illusory alternatives. You can't have rationalizations if you don't have reasons, genuine reasons. So when and where is it appropriate to conclude that systematic power or domination involves what Bourdieu calls misrecognition or mystification? Where, for instance, uh, the dominated embrace a hegemonic ideology or resign to their subordination. <coughs> we, the kind of post-colonial context we've been talking about, patriarchy, any number of examples, viewing their subordination as natural or divinely ordained or inevitable. When is it appropriate to claim this by reference to what Charles Taylor calls a peculiarly modern moral sense? When is it not appropriate? An adequate understanding of human social relations will always require the capacity to distinguish where the debunking of moral thinking and discourse is appropriate and where it isn't. Quick question for each. Um, to to uh, Stephen, my question or worry is, you are not very sociological. Not today. Um, surely the origin of morals is that the human is a social institution, a status. And what every culture has to figure out is how to sustain that status. So the origins of moral is sociological, that we are essentially social, we are institutions and not natural animals. And I was just surprised not to hear. Well, okay. I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to answer you, not probably won't satisfy you, but I'll do it very quickly. Uh, animals are social. In different but ways. They're not institutions. Right. But I mean, uh, uh, bees are social, ants are social, insects are social, uh, primates are social, my cats are social, humans are social. But only humans are moral. 